I vividly remember the first day I started believing in the devil and taking the devil seriously. I was teaching a Bible study at the French Robertson unit with my friend Herb Patterson, and I was going through material on the Gospels, and we had gotten to the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, and I was going through the Beatitudes. And I remember reading the Beatitudes aloud, blessed are the poor in spirit, blessed are the peacemakers, and then I hit the word blessed are the meek. And I saw skeptical looks go across the men's faces, so I stopped and I said, from the look on your faces, it doesn't look like you're buying this. And there was some awkward silence and shuffling of feet, and finally they said, you can't do that in here. In here, meekness is mistaken for weakness, and if you're weak in here, you'll get hurt. And I remember just not having anything to say in response because I don't live in the world that they live in, and I felt really unable to insist that they had to be meek in the brutal world they lived in. And I remember that feeling. I had seen the Beatitudes crash into a brutal, violent world, and what I saw in that wreck wasn't very pretty. Anyway, I let the matter drop, and we moved on. And I remember that night standing out in the parking lot of the prison and looking at the sunset and thinking to myself, you know, I don't know if the Beatitudes make a lot of sense on the outside of a prison as well. I think anywhere you go, meekness is mistaken for weakness. The word Satan means adversary or opponent. And that was the night I realized that love is hard and that there are forces in the world that are antagonistic and oppositional to the way of Jesus in the world. So months later, after the train wreck of a class on the Beatitudes, uh, we got to Jesus washing feet in the Gospel of John. And so I'm reading the story of Jesus washing the disciples' feet, and I see the exact same look of skepticism on the men's faces that I saw when we hit the word meek in the Beatitudes. And I stopped again and said, it doesn't look like you guys are buying this. And they said the same thing. You can't do that stuff out here. That stuff gets mistaken for weakness. But I wanted to sit there a little bit longer. And so I said, but can you think of any time, even, even if it was just for a, a short while, where you, even in this brutal place, live into the way of Jesus? And there was just dead silence, not a word from the class. And then finally, in the front row, uh, Mr. Noriega raises his hand. And I was really curious about what Mr. Noriega would say because he's a very big, intimidating man. And so I called him, I said, Mr. Noriega, he goes, I'm not sure if this is an example of what you're talking about, but sometimes I help uh, my cellmate. And I said, okay, well, explain to me. How, how do you help your cellmate? He says, well, my cellmate isn't too bright. And on this point, everybody in this study agrees, and they start talking about how his cellmate isn't all that intelligent. And as I ask more questions, it becomes obvious to me that his cellmate has a cognitive disability. And because of his mental challenges, he needs some help navigating the prison. And so I said, well, okay, Mr. Noriega, how do you help your cellmate then? He said, well, when I first got my cellmate, he never took off his shoes. Like, never. never. Ne when he slept, he never took off his shoes. When he showered, he never took off his shoes. He never took off his shoes. And in Texas prisons are unair conditioned. And so in the summers, it gets really hot and sweaty. So you can imagine what his feet were like that he never took off his shoes. And Mr. Yargi said this, this perplexed him, and, and so he kept on asking him, why don't you ever take off your shoes? Why don't you ever take off your shoes? His cellmate would never tell him. So days and weeks and months pass, and his cellmate never takes off his shoes. And finally, Mr. Yargi breaks him down and says, why don't you ever take off your shoes? And his cellmate confesses, and he says, I don't know how to take care of my feet, and I'm embarrassed. So Mr. Yargi said, well, I sat him down, and I went to get a, a pan of warm water, and I brought it back into the cell, and I unlaced his shoes for the first time in months. And when he took his shoes off, you could, the sight and the smell were just unimaginable. The nails overgrown, and he said, I sat him down, and I, I took his feet, and I put him in the warm water, and I lifted his feet out of the water and uh, began 
to take his foot in my lap. And he, then he paused and he said, I don't know what anybody would have thought if they walked by the cell at that moment, that little act of tenderness, taking the foot in his hand. And he says, took his stinky feet in my lap and I showed him how and cut his toenails for him. And this is a startling story and everybody in the room is completely quiet. I am crying at what I'm hearing. And then Mr. Argya looks at me and says, is that an example of what you're talking about? And I said, yes, Mr. Argya, yeah. That's an example of what I'm talking about.